Hello, and welcome to Local Writers Read July event on the theme of borders. Um, if you're new to our series, Local Writers Read is a literary arts reading series um, begun in 2018 in Lewiston, Maine. Um, and it happened in cooperation with Quiet City Books. Um, and so because of the pandemic, we have moved digitally this year, which um, it, the benefit is that it expands our reach. And so wherever you're tuning in from, thank you for joining us today. Um, I will be monitoring comments through the reading and there will be time for some discussion and Q&A afterwards. So if you have anything that you'd like to say to our readers, any questions you'd like to ask them, um, feel free to put those in the chat. I will be paying attention to that. Um, and we will also be um, continuing this tomorrow at three o'clock. So be sure to come back for three more readers as well then. Uh, so as I said, our theme is borders, um, thinking about the borders between countries, between the real and the fantastic, um, borders that separate us, that protect us, that close us in. There are just, there's so many different ways to imagine this theme and so many ways that writers have worked with this theme um, across genres and across forms. Um, so we have with us two fantastic main writers tonight. Um, who you will get to hear from. Um, and so I will turn things over to Claire Guyton, my co-organizer for this series, um, to introduce our readers. Thank you. So we have the returning dynamic poetry duo of Deborah Rosh Eifert and Jason Grunstrom Whitney with us tonight. Deborah and Jason are co-workers, close friends, and siblings in poetry. So it's always nice to hear you two read together. We'll we start together. I know you do. It's always great to have your energy here. Okay, so we'll start with Jason, who is a man of many talents. Jason plays a variety of instruments and has performed classical music, jazz, rock, funk, country, blues, and rap. His poetry has most recently appeared in the Three Nations Anthology and in the Underground Writers Association's Anthology of Maine Poets. Bear, Coyote, Raven from Resolute Bear Press is his first full length collection of poems. I hear references in Jason's work to the permeable borders between cultures, between communities, and between the corporeal and spiritual. Deborah is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet, semi-finalist in a competition sponsored by Split Rock Review, and finalist in competitions held by the literary journals Aesthetic Apostle and Chestnut Review. She's a clinical psychologist, feminist, and possibly a Selkie. She lives in Brunswick, Maine, where she was honored to be a reader in this year's Longfellow Days Festival. In her work tonight, Deborah traces the borders between psychological states, between health and illness, and between versions of reality. So let's go ahead and get to it. Jason, if you want to start us off. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Josh, for inviting uh, Deborah and I to read tonight. So the first one I'd like to read is from Bear, Coyote, Raven, and it's called Thin Bears. Coyote saw an old man run across the street in Quebec City. He appeared young, but on the other side, he stooped again. Found another, Coyote said to Bear at an intersection. Bear, raven, and coyote followed the man to the back of a packing plant. In the refrigerator room, they found two women and the man coyote had seen on the street. They were very thin. What the hell are you folks doing down here? Coyote asked, taking off his hat and letting the fur flow. They changed to three thin white bears. We come down 35 years ago and warned the tribes we were dying. We could see the melt. Now there's nowhere to hunt. Countless of, countless of us have starved and died, leaving bones for scrimshaw and medicine. It's good to leave medicine, but only in its place and time. We are moving down. Bear remembered his sister that died in 2002. They found her emaciated remains on the edge of a blueberry field near Callis, Maine. Coyote and Raven sat with him and prayed around the sacred fire for four days. Bear felt death reaching in his new language, drought, hurricanes, fire, autoimmune illness, 
It seemed he added a new word daily. Our brothers and sisters warned others, but the others did not listen. Fair was angry as he thought of his sister and the whales he had seen washed on shore this past summer, their stomachs filled with plastic. The thin bears ate slowly so as not to get sick from the hormone-fed sides of beef. They stayed for a month until strong enough to travel. There will be many more of us, said the old man. Ravens search for a new habitat. Bear helped them walk. Coyote encouraged them on. Each time was getting harder than the time before. And then I'd like to read um, some new poetry or for coming up in the next book. Um, and the first one's called Blues of the Lost Places. It is a difficult choice to leave home. Some have no choice and leave memories, experiences, and ancestral prints indelible on a culture. Places where language was formulated so that Mother Earth can hear the sweet tongue of prayer for crops, harvest, and blessings for all people. One, La 72, concrete and cardboard. Oriolano tries to soothe his hungry children with an old El Salvadoran lullaby. His wife died last year on the train of death, falling then spread upon rails as so many others for buzzards to pick clean. She was their hope. Her mother lived in Salt Lake City. He picks up their last bottle for his three-year-old and lets him nurse water as he worries about separation and detainment camps at the US border. Two, how can I breathe again? This city so unfamiliar, away from gatherings and collecting sweet grass. Why must we go away to live? And why must we die in strange places without death songs to bring us back to our lands before they were taken? Three, the EMTs don't come down here. My brother and I pick up our mother who has just had a heart attack. I remember her yesterday coming from work slowly walking as if collecting blues from the sidewalk. Four, been a long time since I heard the sound of the forest swaying in the wind and the birds flying from trees with patterned flight by the rhythm of traffic. Been a long time since I ate a three square, alone in a dumpster, drinking a carton of yesterday's milk. While people stop and stare and sequester me in their minds to invisibility. Yet I hear my steps on the cold street. Take out my harmonica and play and play till birds start singing, till invisibility superpowered eyes see, till food and housing is abundant, till the forgotten places of everything I knew and gave me reference plays back and the lines I hold, then play and walk again in the blues of lost places. The next one I'd like to read is called Bear and the Brujos. Two brujos were having lunch in a cliff dwelling outside of Santa Fe. Bear heard them as he walked into a massive rock bowl, looking at four fat clouds in the sapphire sky. He climbed an ancient wooden ladder. How are you fellas doing, he asked. Oh, friend, we are doing very well. Can't you see how fat and sleek we are? Bear didn't dare look at what they were having for lunch. We have greed, racism, fear, hostility, worry. These are wild cards for our choosing. It's impossible to lose. They gloated as they continued to eat. Bear looked at their wispy hair, shadow on shadows in cool, dark cave. I saw a child feeding her grandmother the last of their food. The brujos let out a yelp. I saw CNAs, doctors and nurses putting themselves at risk to save others in this pandemic. I saw hundreds of thousands of people fill the streets to end systemic and institutional racism. The brujos screamed 
and their wispy hair started to disintegrate. They sparred through the morning, each bringing forth examples of ego and altruism. Bear kept going until finally the brujos had vanished. The four fat clouds had drifted away. He looked in the clear sky and walked slowly from the cliffs. Soon the rains would come. He could smell it. Though not visible, he saw cactus blooms carpeting the desert floor. This next one is called, his name was Wind. They named him Paul when he was forced off the land to take a name on the reservation. He refused. They named him Paul anyway. He had no idea what Paul meant. In his language, his name was Wind. He found that soldiers enjoyed racing and betting. He raced them and won every time. One day the commander asked that his best rider and best horse race Wind. Beat that red son of a bitch, he demanded of his sergeant. They gave Wind a horse beyond his racing days. He talked to the horse for a long time. Wind won, wasn't even close. Exasperated, the sergeant asked, how did this happen? Wynn looked at the sergeant a long time and then began. You know nothing of freedom. Your horse knows this. You put on fancy saddle, bridle him up and use harsh commands. Your way is death to, you, to your horse and he smells it. When I ride, there is no bridle, no saddle, no harsh words. I talk of the things horses like to talk about. He feels me. I feel him. Just give him little taps with my feet so subtle they go unnoticed by others. He knows the tiny taps just remind. Your way is death and all know it. With that wind swept his arm towards the fort that looked so conspicuous to the surroundings. Wind was arrested that day. There was a lot of money the commander had on the race. He starved in that prison. On the day he died, northern winds swept the prairie and the horses looked from their pens as his family went out to bury him. Next one I'd like to read is a little bit uh, one of those uh, across the borders and boundaries of the spiritual world, Joshua and the fly whisk. I met Josh in a bar outside El Paso. He had the entire bar singing an old Chinese lullaby. The cover band was playing Waylon and Willie on, Waylon and Willie was on break. The song ended and the men laughed and raised their Budweiser's high. Josh slapped his fly whisk on his left shoulder. Not knowing who he was, I elbowed in beside him as the band took the stage. What is a monk doing in a dusty bar in Texas? I inquired. If the Buddha tapped your elbow and ordered a beer, would your attention be here or caught in that musty fly trap? He tapped my head with the end of his fly whisk. It was then that I knew. Seeing this, he slapped the bar with his whisk and disappeared. I rubbed my eyes as I heard the harmonica player do a serviceable Mickey solo. The door to the bar opened. The old man whisked the sky as he stepped into the dusty night. There was a storm coming. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep. Okay, so I was, I was at the opioid summit um, this past week, um, yesterday, or what is today? Yeah, yesterday. And I've uh, coming up on 30 year, 38 years in recovery. And this next one's called Lazarus. O oh, deathless slumber, but one breath for a new direction. It was the third time in a week I was narcan awake, rising again this mortal coil. Do the dreams of angels have dark passion thinking of me? And my death convulsed presence like shattered glass on a glass floor, looking out and in, seeing prisms of light formed and carried myriad. 
I heard the EMTs talking as I rose, endless in flight like a clipped wing Icarus, only to burn the wings of creation again, and maybe then again. They saw my track marks and held me in tiny thought boxes to be sorted and sent along with the mind clips of collective trash thrown from the blue screen day. Did they see the gun of a man blasting innocence on dark nights, forever ruining my taste for gin and guns? Did they see the anger beating upon my flesh, tattooing trauma in hopes that this cycle be unbroken? the Lazarus that does not rise to inflict upon future progeny. This did not happen. And as I rose that third time in a week, angels hurried and their songs were of life and beauty and that I was someone. The net was cast, the sail caught wind, its direction to the east. Oh, but then came the triggers and the screams and the light, slightest sounds that wake me. I scored and then seeing a cloud in the sky that looked like Our Lady of Guadalupe, I threw the thin nails and my tidy box of forgetting into a fire on the street that Jake, Tina and Fred warmed themselves with before climbing into tattered sleeping bags, bundled in yesterday's jaws of societal stigma. Now I stand in the streets bringing the antidote to fear by educating, loving, caring, community, and crying with other Lazarus children in grief and loss and days of recovery. One more. Yeah. Three minutes. Okay. Um, and the last one I like to do. Um, it's called Parable of the Unmasked Warriors. Stanley carried his quarterly journal of fear unbridled in his AR-15. He looked at his wife. You ready? She looked at him with adoring eyes. Stanley, you are my hero, she said as she grabbed canned peaches from their bunker. Stanley thought of his leader refusing to wear a mask on national TV and hitched his ill-fitted camouflage pants up and smiled. They demonstrated at the governor's office, holding up signs that read, give me liberty or give me death, as they munched fries from a box that read, freedom fries. Death came to them after they got back home. He pointed a long bony finger at Stanley from the living room as he stood in deep shag rug. Get the hell out of my house or you're a done goner, mister. Death just pointed. Stanley, who in tarnation are you yelling at? Asked his wife as she stared toward the place he was facing. She noticed the velvet picture of the king needed straightening. You hold it right there, mister. He went to the bunker and grabbed the rocket launcher and squared up to death. Death just pointed. His wife screamed. The picture of the king fell from the wall. The blast blew up the house, having hit a gas main. Down the road at the Zen monastery, Japanese, Japanese monks were demonstrating archery. Even with their masks and their bleach wipes that they wiped the bows with after each shot, they released fear, anxiety, all thoughts with an arrow into the eternity of the bullseye. And now on to my dear sister um, and poet sister, Deborah Rosh Eifert. Thanks, Jason. Those were amazing as usual. Um, lately, my family has just crossed in a borderland. We've been kind of dealing with the border of health and, and illness. So a few of these poems are gonna be focused on that. The first one is called Waiting to Hear. Glimpses out the ED door. A single crow, carrion seeker, flaps its wings in the hospital parking lot. Empty of songbirds, a trio of white pines poke their, spike, poke their spikes at the sky. In the overbright hallway, voices fade in and out, 
radio stations on a long drive to someplace I've never been. My journey's guide, a map marked with only bird shadows and lichen. My husband lies on a gurney, gray as a badly cooked roast, attached to machines tentacled with weeds and tubes. Green neon lines squirm across small screens, cold boxes ping alarms. Beyond the curtain, always beyond the curtain, footsteps. The only air to breathe squeezes from hidden fans, a whine of tepid recirculated air, constant mosquito hum of dissonant chords. Everything I inhale feels stale. My ears are hollow spirals of nothingness. Words vanish. I have only jumbled sounds, formless prayers, and a dusty rosary in my pocket. The diagnosis poems, Q&A. My husband embodies a question mark. Legs and trunk straight, back hunched into a curve, head a hanging serif. Question, where did my real husband go? Answer, real is whatever exists in this moment. Answer, somewhere backward in the time stream. Answer, you must adapt to this new reality. Question, why is this diagnosis, Parkinsonism, so vague? Answer, he has some of four kinds of movement disorder and 100% of none. Seriously, question seriously, which disease does he have? Answer, you only know what is in an eggshell after it breaks. Not sufficient, try again. Answer, does it matter? You do the same for every type, exercise and prayer. Unacceptable reply. I repeat the question, please respond. This answer is backward and is only available after six weeks delay. Price your entire deductible, a ream of records, at least one CT scan and six hours of driving for a one hour doctor visit. After an additional hour on hold, please speak to a rude patient access specialist to place your order. Question, how do we stop dreading the future? Please press one if you want to receive a reassuring religious platitude. Press two to be told you should try yoga and massage. Press three to place an order for CBD oil. Press four to make an appointment with a therapist. Press five to hear soothing ocean waves and a guided meditation. Question, is a question mark the right descriptor? Answer, no. Use a comma. It has a similar shape, but marks a divide. A divide? Yes, before, comma, after. I felt like I needed to go to a slightly different place after that kind of brutal, blank, forceful <laughs> description of Parkinson's. So this next diagnosis poem is called, Your Parkinson's Reminds Me of the Tale of Tam Lin. In the tale, Tam Lin is a mortal man trapped by the fairy queen. To rescue him, his true love Janet must pull him from his horse during a fairy procession and hold on to him even as the fairies change him into wild animals, some dangerous, some slippery or quick. She ultimately succeeds, her love enabling her to persist despite her fear. You stand the way a cobra rears in front of prey, a slight swaying, hypnotic, the juncos jittering their wings under the bird feeder, the uncontrolled movement of your hands. Your back hunches, a high arch in the middle, your head hanging down, a white rhino with no horn. When the doctor pulls you backward as a test, you topple a gazelle felled by the pounce of a cheetah. On bad days, you walk the same way a sloth climbs, grasp a handhold, pull yourself forward, pause. When you can't see where I am, you slow roll, manatee-like, until I flow into your field of vision. <clears throat> 
bullfrog swallowing, throat working so hard it swells outward. Your eyelids muscles spasm, you blink like a star mole. Creature after creature blooms from your disease. But when the spoon for your cereal shakes so hard from tremors, it won't come to your mouth. Your tears are pure human. I must hold on, hold on. This one is called Two Fangs. Hunker on the coffee table, clunky package, a grab bar shower aid for my husband. I walk wide around it, give space to this mad rabid dog disguised in innocent packaging. Bright colors, like a toy, a fun helper. From beneath wrappings, the assisted device hisses prophecies that I alone hear. Weeks tumble by, the balance assist bar whimpers in its plastic container. I punish it, leave it caged. Someday, I will grasp open the box, suction cup grab bar onto the shower's porcelain wall. Reality will snap my hand in red jaws and bite with these two fangs. He is frail now. Sometimes he can barely stand. This is called formalities. Dress in, in frothy formal wear to face your fresh disasters. Wear a satin gown to waltz on a frozen pond. Murmuration of starlings and ice fisher pulls at the birds in your mind. Drape yourself in lace to cross a bridge in a blizzard. Bow deeply to the water. Walk in the rhythm of falling snow. Don a smoky chiffon dress to swim in winter waters. Let your eyes turn seaweed green. Your limbs move like tides. Your wispy skirts sway in the blue-gray currents. Your tuxedoed partner, white gloves on spastic hands. His illness fears patter fast as a fox across his mind. Be his shadow, his mirror, shine his image onto his patent tap shoes. He dances on the ice glazed river, tappity clack, tappity clack. Rapid fish dart beneath the solid surface. What net, what ladder, what song could capture them? And still in the Diagnoses Poems series, is this one. When, when someone in your family gets a serious illness, you hear a lot, of, a lot of cliches and a lot of platitudes suddenly emerge. And actually they emerge and they wallop you day after day, those cliches. Um, and one that I keep hearing is illness changes the caretaker too. So that's the title of this poem, illness changes the caretaker too. Since his diagnosis, anxiety spins me through nebulas drifts me through airless darkness. I tension vibrate like a metal violin playing high notes shuddering with echoes. I go to the ocean when worry string slices me. Salt in the air settles on my skin, touch of a mother. Surf rhythm, a heartbeat, steady, unlike the squeeze and thump pump of the tired muscle in my chest. The hummingbird just under my clavicle calms to surf's repeating whoosh, thrum. I sit on a rock, worry about his decline. Observe my toes under seawater. My toenails seen through tears and seafoam lace resemble barnacles. My feet calcify, a layer of barnacles on rock. My legs merge with granite, limbs gray stone flecked with mica. Torso, arms, wrists transform into silvery gray driftwood branches against the rock. Bladder rack, maiden's hair, sea fern wash up against my hands, take root in my bones. My fingers, a tide pool garden. Periwinkles wander, 
a small starfish rests on a thumb knuckle. My head begins to morph into a weathered sea wash stub when a laughing gull lands on my shoulder. I send my mind into hers. We merge, thoughts blue salt, soul white winged. We soar above waves, sand, rock. We shriek wild cries and sob mingled laughs. Our vision all horizon. How am I doing? Um, getting away from the illness and wellness, um, and I'm going to read a couple of songs, a couple of poems about time. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm doing on time. If I have a little more, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, I think time is mysterious and it stops, starts, freezes, goes at different speeds. So time is constantly in a border state, I, I believe. And I wrote this one about time. It's called Ephemeral and Constant. The single quantity, time, melts into a spider web of times. Carlo Rivelli, The Order of Time. Stop at the end, at, stop at the edge of land. Sea foam greets dark sand. Listen, waves, a heart pulse rumbles. Celadon Atlantic, indigo ribbons of deep current. Distant humpback breaches, bridges water to sky. Sky, a bowl of black purple night. The Big Dipper glitters its silver flecks. Ladled time pours to earth, catches in a sea urchin's spines. This light thousands of years old. Throw your watchworks far out to sea. Feel time. Flurries on the wind, ephemeral and constant. I'm gonna do one last one just because it's dedicated to Jason. So I'm gonna make it quick. Modern physics elder wisdom for Jason Gun Grunstrom Whitney of the Passamaquoddy Bear Clan. Time flows faster at the top of a ladder than on the pine boards of my kitchen floor. Speeds swifter high on Mount Washington than it drifts over a kayak in Passamaquoddy Bay. And an astronaut's twin comes home from space older than his brother who stayed in Houston. I visit a hill near Mount Katahdin, clear night, new moon, no light pollution, no smog, only wind sounds, crickets. The deep dome of the firmament looms black, undertones of indigo. Thousands of stars glitter. The great bear crouches near the star mist of the Milky Way. Time moving so fast, time's near absence is created on the heaven smoke road where your great grandparents walk to join the great creator. Here we go. Yes, thank you both. Um, every time I hear the two of you read, just your work is so striking and it just, it does so much and um, is always unexpected um, and just remarkable. Um, so thank, thank you, for, you for that. Um, and there have been um, some very good comments from our listeners as well. Um, those were very well received for, on both parts. Um, all right, I'm going to take a moment. We're going to bring in out um, some of our readers that will be um, reading tomorrow. And we're gonna have a little bit of time for a Q&A and discussion. Um, so if you have any questions that you'd like to ask either of our readers, um, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, there's a slight delay, but um, we will get to those. Um, and so while our readers are joining us, um, so Courtney from Quiet City is, um, has been a part of this series from the beginning um, in hosting us and just supporting what we do. Um, she wasn't able to be here tonight, but um, I know one of the things that she and I and Claire have always talked about um, is really just how art is a way to kind of step away from the world and at the same time, a way to kind of, to make sense of it, to um, look at it in new ways, to interpret it. Um, and I think tonight's work is such a good example of both of those to, to comfort and to understand and just, it does so much. Um, and I know with this series, that's always been one of the things that we've been so happy about is being able to come together around art and to really just celebrate and to take these moments together. Um, 
So it's, it's very good to be able to do that. Um, and so- Josh, this, let me interrupt you for just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Before we go on to something else, I wanted to give um, Jason and Deborah a chance to talk about that last poem that Deborah wrote to dedicated to Jason. If you guys want to, if it's something you don't want to talk about, that's fine. Sure. Um, well, I don't know how to describe this. So Jason and I get into some very odd conversations at work. We can have a conversation at work that goes from Mingus playing the bass to the nature of time to what's going to happen with that patient up on the third floor to, you know, how, what's the best way to get a stain out of the carpet. Our conversations just go all over the place. And at some point in time, he had told me about the native tradition, about what happens to the ancestors. Do you want to talk about that part, Jason, a little bit? And yeah, I think, and I agree with you, Deborah. We always get into just incredible conversations about a wide variety of things, and I just love it and uh, look forward to seeing you again, that's for sure. So, yeah, um, it's viewed that when people pass, pass away, that um, they go on the ancestors' trail. Um, so, the, the Milky Way, basically. So, they're, and oftentimes we feel that sometimes we can see that and see our ancestors in the Milky Way as they go. Yeah. So he had told me about that. And then um, my husband, back in a time when he was doing better and we did more things like this, we went up to Patton, which is up near Mount Katahdin. And I had never been in any place that dark before. I, I lived in Cleveland for 30 something years before I moved back to Maine. It was so clear. I felt like I could have like, dunked my head in the Milky Way. It felt so close and so vivid. And it triggered that thought about Jason. And at the same time, I started reading the book about the nature of time and it all just sort of flowed together into that poem. And I felt like I couldn't write this poem about time and the Milky Way without somehow acknowledging what a profound influence Jason has been on my poetry in my life. So there you go. And you do it well, my sister. <laughs> What a great you. story. Thank you so much for talking about that with us. And hello sure. to Sue and Ann and Jen. It's great to see you ladies. Hello. Sue and Ann uh, and Jen will be reading for us uh, tomorrow at three, right? Three? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, do you guys have any thoughts or questions? Just just taking it in and enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think there's just so many. The, the the theme is just wonderful because there's just so many different ways that we could look at this, and and um, I think we've all become very much more aware of our bodies and where we are in relation to the planet and other people and wellness or not, you know, on that whole continuum. So it it's it's really interesting to see how it's coming out in people's creative work. Yeah. Anne, I think you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I, uh, Deborah, um, something really struck me, the, the idea of the border between before and after, um, as that's, that's a border that is um, different than other borders in that, it's less porous. <laughs> you, you can't go back, and um, you know. Yeah. But, so, so I think I've I've thought before this reading, I thought of borders as being something that is um, arbitrary and uh, you know, and can can be pulled away and um, are kind of a magnet for attention because of their arbitrariness and because of the fact that that um that some people recognize them some people don't or some beings recognize them mm -hmm. and some beings don't but the before and after is a border in time that i i think it maybe is harder to breach mm -hmm. it, it demands respect in a different way which is, mm -hmm. thank you for making it bringing that to my attention and oh, I'm glad it, I'm glad it provokes that thought. Yeah, you can. And that's, again, why I get fascinated. And there's so many references to time in my poems, because 
yeah, that before and after border place is a, is a place that we can't just undo it. It isn't just something that somebody put there. Um, it's something that that exists in time and time, although it, it time flows one direction, but it also flows at different speeds under different conditions. And it's just it's fascinating. It's it's a it's a border in time. It's also a border in self, because mm -hmm. you know you are irreparably changed in the after in a way that you notice. I, I mean, I suppose we're irreparably, irreparably changed all the time by the things that that happen with us. But when you have one of those before and after moments, something that's um, so consequential in your life, you're mm -hmm. very aware of how you're affected in the after, and you feel like you're never the same. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so true. Yeah, that's very true. Um, a lot of um, it's interesting. I was just thinking about time in relationship to um, Leslie Marmon Silco's ceremony and then Scott Mamaday's House Made of Dawn. And it's really interesting in the experiences that happen there and how people are changed. But in reading those books, oftentimes, people from a Western thought pattern, they have a hard time grasping it because it's not in linear time, it's in circular time. And mm -hmm. so that kind of represents that our experiences have, uh, have multiple meanings across time and space, that's for sure. That's well said. Jen, I think you were gonna say something. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, my space bar wasn't working to unmute. <laughs> um, I, I like how these poems all talked about borders that are sometimes very fuzzy, like the before and after, when do we become a different person? And the border between like the spirit world and this world, I think is very fuzzy. And I just, I love that, that these borders are, are not so rigid. And I just found that that was a really neat thread that carried through both performances. That was wonderful. Now yeah, that's well said. Uh, so Claire, I know um, you had a couple questions. Um, do you want to start I, off? I always have questions. <laughs> um, all right. So Jason, my question for you is I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about the title of your collection and how your work connects you to community and strengthens your personal relationships? Mm, that's a good question. Um, the title of the book is uh, Bear, Coyote, and Raven, and it's um, through Resolute Bear Press. So the way that that, that a kind of, in, our, in my personal relationships in this particular collection of poems, it connects me to the Native community we, we always identify as coming from a tribe, our clan, and then the person. So there's always that sort of homage in the tradition itself. Um, and in this collection too, I talk about a lot of thought themes, um, addiction, um, homelessness, uh, being on the road and, and whatnot. So um, a lot of those are within that and my relationship and what I do for work every day at Riverview um, is, is something certainly that has deepened um, and steeped as I think about these poems and, and, um, and their relationship to me, relationship to others. The other thing that's interesting about um, relationships in a general question is that we tend to view that all's in relationships. So we don't just see like the anthropomorphic sense that human beings, you know, we're all related. We also see, um, and you know, like the birds are our brothers and sisters, the animals are our brothers and sisters, four-legged, two-legged swimmers, crawlers, insects, the wind, the moon, the stars, and they all have their certain medicines that, that we share together on this collective web. So um, I think as I think about this book and, and writing it, I, I thought very heavily about those relationships and environmental degradation um, and how that affects not just us as human beings, but the entire planet. And um, so sometimes when I'm driving to work, um, 
when I happen to see wild asters, purple wild asters growing up for, through concrete, I'm always like, yeah, all right, woo, nature's going to come back. But, you know, we have to be very careful and we have to be very decisive about what we, how we tread on this earth. And, you know, are we going to continue the way we are? Or are we going to learn to start walking as if our feet are kissing our mother on her skin? Oh, what a beautiful way to put that. Um, and thank you for appreciating wild asters. I'm another person who loves wild asters. In fact, I, there are quite a few weeds that I think are beautiful. I was just talking to some friends about that. I, um, I played gardener a few years ago when I had more time and then I sort of fell off the path and uh, let the, the yard go. And my poor husband is uh, kind of horrified by, by it and spends a fair amount of time hacking away at things. And I just go, oh gosh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I haven't taken care of that, but secretly I love it. Like, cause I love the, um, the, the Queen Anne's lace and the, all the wild white asters and the wild Ooh. purple asters. And I mean, they're beautiful, the you know, goldenrod and there's just so many beautiful things that spring up. And then, and then all the daylilies I've planted are all around. It's just, I love it. It's jungle-like and wild and pretty to me. So mm -hmm. thanks for that image. Um, so I do have a question for Deborah. if no one else wants to jump in. Does anyone have a, okay, let me ask Deborah my question. Okay, Deborah, you often move from painful emotion into a reverie of natural landscape, something I love about your work. And I want you to talk a little bit about that for me. You know, I've, I've been pondering that question for a long time, actually. Um, I think I think that comes from a couple of things. One thing as a, a poet, um, there's there's a school of thinking about poetry that the thing about a poet is that we're always noticing. We're noticers. That's that's what we do. We notice things and highlight them in a way that other people don't always see them. Um, so, and. In addition to being a poet and a psychologist, I'm also, I also have attention deficit disorder. So here's an example. I was at Cleveland Clinic one time. I had an appointment at Cleveland Clinic, which is a huge hospital, enormous, hundreds of people showing up there every day. 30 people standing at a crosswalk waiting for the light to change. The light changes, people start moving and I'm like, oh, look at the butterfly. <laughs> As I, I key into to na to nature, I key into natural things. So there really, I, I actually did see a crow in the hospital parking lot when I went to the emergency room with him and I felt like I can't handle this anymore. I can't handle this anymore. And I went and looked out at the yard and there was a crow and then it <clears> turned <throat> into this music in my head. So I think that it's what I reach for when I'm in pain. I reach for the natural world. I look for what, what is in my attention that gives me some music to hang on to that I can keep going and turn into writing. If that makes any sense. I know what I meant. <laughs> no, it makes it makes perfect sense. And I think mm -hmm. it's um, the fact that you can you can trace your mind, right? So you can mm -hmm. you can trace where you're going from that emotion into the nature and then double back. Mm -hmm. Like what is that, what is that reverie sort of doing for you? And so um, you know, then you cast meaning back onto your experience mm -hmm. through the, the exploration that is going on in your mind of what you see around you. I think it's, yeah. it's a really lovely thing about your work. And I, th I also think that humans cause a lot of chaos and there's a lot of chaos in our lives, but nature, ten it tends to be consistent. You know, if a cat is going to do cat things, a crow is going to do crow things. If you look at the moon, you're going to see the moon maybe a different time each way, but it's it's going to be consistent, unlike people that are completely unpredictable. So that nature is reassuring to me, which is why I tend to turn to it in times of crisis. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, so we'll wrap up in just a moment, um, but does anyone have any final thoughts that you'd like to say before we um, end the night? I'd like to say one thing if I could, and that is um, I'm just really honored once again to read with my poet sister, Deborah. It's just astounding sometimes. Um, we didn't have a chance to kind of talk before this, but I'm always amazed that every time we read together, it just seems like it dovetails right in. Once again, uh, my sister. 
we're on we're on a, we're on synthesis. Um, I wanted to thank local writers Reed for inviting me and for being such a wonderful presence for the arts in this area. Um, it was an honor to be asked and I greatly value what you do and I can't wait to hear Jen and Ann and Sue tomorrow. Well, I second that last. I can't wait to hear you guys read either. Thank you so much, Deborah. It was wonderful right. having you both. Yes, yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thank you both for coming. Um, thank you to everybody also who tuned in today. Um, as always, thank you to Courtney and Quiet City Books for supporting the series. Um, and to the Lewiston Public Library who co-sponsors what we do here. Um, so this video will be um, on Facebook and it will be up on our YouTube channel as well um, in a little bit. So it will be available to come back and watch if you missed any of it or if you know anybody else who would enjoy seeing it. Um, tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to hear Sue and Anne and Jen do part two of our July event. Um, and then tune in also next Friday, um, LA Arts is doing a digital art walk for Lewis and Auburn. Um, that also will be free and streamed online. And Local Writers Read is happy to take part in that as well. Um, so we may be in a pandemic, but there is still lots of good art going on. Um, so keep an ear out, um, tune in and join us for all of the fun. Um, thank, and yeah, one more time, just thank you and everybody enjoy your evening. Thanks thank all, you. goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.